Hey guys, uh, it's Libby and my mom. Hi. And we're doing another review in the series of mom reviews. They were doing The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield. And I've talked about this book a lot on my channel, so you've all heard my take on the summary of the novel. Now mom's gonna give you a summary. Spoiler free, we're gonna do the first part of the video spoiler free, and then we'll move on to spoilers later. I want to start off by saying that this is one of the very few books in my life that I have read, finished it, and then liked it so much that I just went right back to the very beginning and, and read through again, starting to be really good. Um, it is a very good book. It, is, it has a fascinating plot twist, and that, in fact, was, was what I wanted to do, was to go back to the beginning and say, okay, what were the cues and the clues that, that the author was, was laying out that I missed? Um, book page after page after page. And and there were some, you know, yeah. she she's very honest. And um but I was I was very surprised. So the um the narrator of the book is a young woman Mar Margaret 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 who uh is the the daughter of a bookshop owner and ha is is very rare, it, snobby. Uh, yeah, yes. very very rare interesting books. Um um, she's reclusive. She's she's written a few um, essays, biographical essays about obscure nineteenth-century figures, um, and then one day, pretty much out of the blue, she gets a letter from um, from a very famous writer, um, a, a novelist, uh, Vida Winter is her name, and Miss Winter is. As, as the author tells us, Miss Winter is, you know, the best known figure in British li the British literary world. Um, modern. The literary. modern, yeah, she's... she's Margaret's the, sort of condescending to her. Right, she's she has, Margaret hasn't novels. read any of her, any of her books. Um, but suddenly she gets a letter from Miss Winter saying, I would like you to write, write my biography. Um, this is interesting in part because Miss Winter has given a number of interviews as she became a famous famous author and and um, and one who's won a number of prizes. I mean, a good a good author. Um, she's given lots of interviews about her background, and they're all completely different. I mean, they're all fiction, and it becomes clear. I mean, I think one of the favorites is that she was uh, she was the child of Scottish missionaries in in India, and her parents died, and she tells the Indians all about you know, the scent of the highlands and the sound of the bagpipes, and when she actually goes to Scotland, she hates it all and she wants to go back to India. But those are all complete fiction. So Margaret is intrigued by this, but, um, but she's a little wary. Yeah. And as part of, when she decides to go visit Miss Winter and talk about this, this project, she finds a book in her father's bookstore in the very rare book, very rare and the expensive vault. book section. Um, that's that was one of the the most famous books, and it's the title is Thirteen Tales of Change and Desperation. Change and Desperation, right? Thank you. Um, and she she reads through them. Um, she's not quite sure why this you know pretty standard modern book is in that is in that collection, but but she reads the tales um, with growing interest. I mean, she really loves them. And as she gets towards the end, you know, she's done the eleventh tale, and there's not much of the book left, and she's getting worried because she wants there to be more. And she finishes the twelfth tale, and there are no more. There are only she does 12. not skip to the end of a book <laughs> and look at what it is, which I totally would have done. Oh, I don't. But so that. Margaret is totally surprised uh, when she's like, "Wait, there is no thirteenth no tale. No tale. Why is it called Thirteen Tales of Change and Desperation?" Mm, interesting. So she so she goes off to um, to meet Miss Winter, and. As the as the story unfolds, what you what you what the the bulk of the book is Miss Winter's recollections, and she's very insistent on doing this in the right order. Um, Margaret's no not allowed to ask questions. Um, she's she's living there at Miss Winter's house, and there are a lot of mysteries, which I will talk about. We'll talk about later in the post spoiler yeah. in the spoiler part. Um, but as the, as the book goes on, Margaret not only l learns about Miss Winter's life and, and, you know, becomes more and more fond of her, um, 
impressed by her story, but also naturally learns about her own life. Um, so. You said Margaret's the narrator, but actually a lot, about half the book is in Vida's voice as she's telling as she's, the story. Yeah. So, time period. Diane Satterfield is, uh, I believe the term is allergic to dates. So this book, it's very unclear what time period this is all happening in. We know that Margaret's, Margaret's part of the story is taking place after the invention of cars and, um, and movies. There doesn't seem to be a war going on. There's, there's, no, war, there's yeah. no particular... But I don't think there are computers or typewriters, because, which doesn't actually make sense, because... There would have to be typewriters, but... Yeah, but Margaret and Vida don't use typewriters. They write by hand. And then a lot of um, Vida's story takes place in her childhood, so like 70 years earlier, and then even before her childhood, um, about her, her mother. Um, so I... The, the, there is a movie, which is not good, um, that sets Margaret's part of the story in the modern times and then Vida's childhood in, like, the 50s. Um, I sort of see Margaret's story taking place in the 50s or the early 60s, because um, I think that's just sort of how I picture Margaret's clothes. Yeah, and I think, I think um, the previous generation, you know, the generation of Vida's parents, uh -huh. was... Maybe more like twenties or thirties. Uh -huh. I mean, as you think about the what's happening there and yeah. And at one point, let's see, um, the she, her Vida's mother um, puts on the a dress worn by Vida's grandmother, uh, and so and the way it's described, it sounds very turn of the century, mm -hmm. and I think and it's supposed to be out of place. So imagine. Um, Isabel, the, the woman in the old dress, going to a, like a party in the 1920s wearing a dress. From, from the Edwardian. Yeah, yeah from, she'd look really yeah. out of place. Yeah. She, yeah, she would look really out of place. Yes. yes. And that's the point. So I think that's all we can say without getting into spoilers because this book is very easy to spoil. So if you haven't finished it, go away. Just leave. Leave right now. It'll, it it'll, at least once. Yeah. It'll be totally ruined for you if yeah. you watch this part. So... I think the thing that ties the three books we're talking about in this series together is the interesting villain situation. Um, yeah. Shalman, obviously very interesting. Annis from Winter's, Winter Spell. I almost said Winter's Tale. Mm -hmm. Different thing. Uh, interesting. And then this book maybe doesn't have a villain, or do you think it does? There's certainly people who do bad things, like Charlie. He, yep, he Charlie breaks does bad people. things. He breaks people. Um, Adeline. But yeah, but... but the people, the people who do bad things, you have clearly, you you understand clearly why they do them, and mostly it's because they're themselves crippled in some in yeah. some way. I mean, they're emotionally or or. So, do you think Isabel has an excuse? Because she's also she she doesn't do any do anything quite as terrible as Charlie does. Um, she doesn't murder or rape anybody, but she's very callous towards her children. Um, and everybody. I mean, it's yeah. not clear. I mean, she marries somebody who then dies, and he appears to die perfectly normally. I yes. mean, he dies yeah. of the I, flu or something. Yeah, I don't think we're meant to be suspicious about right. that. Um, but, it, I mean, she wasn't, you know, no, her. nobody was telling her as she was growing up, you need to, you should be thoughtful of other people, yeah. for example. And it turns out you actually have to teach children compassion yeah. in, so in many instances. There's they, a real lack of authority figures. Yeah. So the, the adults um, either lock themselves in their rooms or die fairly or quickly. They're, or they're servants. Yeah. Um, or so the, the or getting older and older and, and try and try and keep things going but but aren't really authority yeah. figures. There is somebody who comes along yes. and um, then and then Hester shows up. And then Hester. I really liked the Hester scenes. Um, and that's the only part of the movie that is good. I think they cast Hester very well. Okay. She, she looked the way she did in my head. Mm -hmm. um, although it is set in the 50s. So, like, Hester is in the 50s while the rest of the story is in the 20s. Weird. In my head. It oh, makes okay. sense. It makes sense. Okay. In my head. Yeah, but I would have to... I don't think Hester's... I mean, I think Hester does things that prove unfortunate um, in, in several instances... But she's doing them out of a desire to help. Mm -hmm. And she believes she is helping. She gets so 
and enamored with the idea of helping that she doesn't notice that actually she's not helping. Yeah, them. when she separates she's, the twins. We have we have we mentioned twins yet? Oh yeah, we're in the spoiler section. So everyone in theory, when they're watching this, has read it and they know. That's right. They know that everyone is a twin. Or or not quite. Everyone or, yeah, is a twin. Yeah. Or or yeah. Or even more. Yeah. yeah. So I don't. I don't. I. I don't think there are any bad mm -hmm. characters, even Adeline. Um, or perhaps George, who is um, Isabel and Charlie's father, who really should have been more responsible with raising his children. Yeah. But was not. But was not. And, and his wife had just died. His wife had just died. And I mean, when you read other, other novels, the, the idea of fathers being responsible for raising their children is a relatively yeah. recent one. You know, a hundred years ago, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think it was such a big deal. So, um, yeah, there, so there are a lot of unhappy characters who make poor choices, and mom phrase right there. That yeah, sorry, and that really plays out badly for a lot of people. Um, but, but the twins are presented as so, so impaired. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I don't think you can consider Adeline a villain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Adeline does do a lot of really horrible things. She attempts to murder her sister's baby. She she does murder um, John the Dig. She murders John the Dig. Um, and she murdered the missus. I think it's implied that she murdered the missus. Oh, I missed that. I thought the missus yeah. just died. The missus is old. Um, in the movie, it's definitely, it's straight out said that she killed her. Oh. Um, I, think it, I think it is implied in the book, but okay. the movie might have colored my perception. Okay. Like a big lump of ceiling lands on her head. That's right, because the house has been is is decaying. Yeah. Can we talk about the end? The the end end. Yeah. After Vida's is dead. Okay. Doctor Clifton. Yes. There there's like a little tiny bit of romance for Margaret. Yeah. Squeezed in at the end there. Did you like that? Oh yeah, I thought it was cool. Yeah. I liked. Um, Doctor Clifton gave that interesting prescription to Margaret when oh, she yeah. um when she had, you know, wandered around on the moor in the soaking, freezing rain and gotten herself sick. A la Jane Eyre or Marianne yeah. Dashwood. Yeah, so he, he uh, noticed that she reads a lot of romantic 19th century fiction with the heroines that get sick. Yeah. And so he prescribes um, Sherlock Holmes, the case book of Sherlock Holmes. So I thought, I thought that was great. So I was very happy that he ends up... Um, um, he and Margaret end up happy, and you know, and the, and that's the other thing is that she's become she's mm -hmm. become whole. Yeah, and I think she she needs to move out of her parents' house. Yeah, because her her mom never really gets fixed, and even though Margaret's like an adult now, she's still she she has never recovered from losing one child. She can't. Yeah. She's not happy with the child that that she has. Mm -hmm. She's she's only mourning. I mean. She's a, she's a little happy, but she just is constantly getting headaches and yeah. everything has to be quiet. And, and they can't celebrate Margaret's birthday. Right, because it's the death day of, of Mara. Mm -hmm. Margaret's mother never, never achieves any sort of resolution. Mm -hmm. but, but on the other hand, Margaret is better able to deal with it, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that in itself may actually help, mm -hmm. help the mother. Mm -hmm. And also in, in seeing the way that people can come in pairs. I think, like, at first, Adeline and Emmeline are clearly a pair because they're twins and they do everything together and they make up their own language. And um, Hester theorizes that they have a shared, like, there's one personality between them and Adeline has all of the, like, vicious and and hateful qualities and Adeline, Emmeline, has all of the um, passive and docile qualities. Um, but then you realize how destructive this is for the two of them. Yeah. And arguably, Emmeline and Vida would make a better pair, or sort of Emmeline and her baby. And it seems like Emmeline and her baby might have made a good pair, and Adeline recognizes this and tries to kill the baby. Yep. Yeah, Adeline basically won't... Her bond with her, her twin is so strong that, that anything that threatens that, she, mm -hmm. she just has to attack. Mm -hmm. Um, so, do you think there's sort of a mystery at the end? The library is burning down. Vida has to is trying to save Emmeline, um, and she's already gotten the baby out of there. Yeah, right? she's gotten the baby out, um, and she comes back, and the two the two twins the are twins fighting. are fighting. Um, and 
Um, she thinks she grabs Emmeline and saves her, and her face had been badly burned. So any, any sort of distinguishing quality is definitely gone. Um, so we think she, we, she's saved Emmeline um, and that Adeline dies in the fire. Um, but then maybe it's not so clear at the end. I can't remember what throws a shade well, of doubt on that, that maybe she saved when, Adeline instead. When, when Vida is telling the story of the fire, mm -hmm. she says to Margaret, or not to Margaret, to the world, she says, oh, Emmeline. Mm -hmm. After, I mean, she's the one who who casts a bit of doubt on mm -hmm. which one which one did I actually save, mm -hmm. which did I pull, pull free of the the do, blazing. Do you think you know which? Or well, I, I mean, I can't understand why she would have said that because the, because the person I think person I think we're supposed to understand that Margaret or that Vida doesn't know, which is a little hard to believe uh -huh. actually, unless it's that. It's that this twin is just so, so cut off mm -hmm. from everything. I mean, whichever twin it is, she's lost her other twin, and she's lost everything. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I kind of thought it was Emmeline who was saved, but... Uh -huh. The first time I read it, I thought it was Adeline, just because why would she mention it if it wasn't, and because of irony. Um, but then the second time I read it, I think it really has to be Emmeline, because Emmeline's baby, um, who Vida saved, grows up, has a life of his own. Margaret finds him and realizes that um, he's Emmeline's son. Mm -hmm. And she thinks that Emmeline is in the house because she thinks Vida is Adeline. She thinks there's only two of them. Um, so she brings Ambrosius, the baby, who's now very big, yeah. um, to see who she thinks is his mother. And there's like a very emotional scene, and I don't think that Adeline would have reacted that way. Yeah, yeah. I think it's got to be Emmeline. So you have the mother-son reunion. Mm -hmm. So that's comforting. Yeah, yeah, that's good. But it, it does cause you to wonder why, why does Vida, why is Vida mm -hmm. still... Mm -hmm. And it may just be that Emmeline was so traumatized by that whole fire and loss and everything. I mean, she certainly, she certainly lost her baby. I mean, the baby's not dead, but she doesn't know that. Yeah. Um, she lost her sister. Um, she lost all of the props. Now she and Vida had had been yeah. able to 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 make a pair. Well, when Hester separated them, she said that Adeline went like catatonic mm -hmm. and never adapted to a world without her twin. But Emmeline, possibly sort of be either because of her own nature or because she had Vida there with her as well, um, was able to sort of heal and and lead a solitary life. Yeah. That's very interesting. Maybe I have to read it again. Three times a while. No, I've read a few other things. In, in oh, the... okay, okay. Uh, well, then you have to read it three times in a row starting oh, now, yeah. oh, obviously, okay. for yeah. five times this month. Uh, so we highly recommend this book. Highly. Five out of five, five out of five. Yep. Yep. Okay. See you in the next video soon.